Welcome everyone to tonight's presentation from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. My name is Marisa Gomez and I manage community education and collaboration projects at the museum. And we are excited to honor Native American Heritage Month uh, tonight and all month long with a slew of programs that connect our community with the Amamutsun Tribal Band and their collaborators, um, including tonight's uh, talk with speaker Mike Grone, who is here and loves surfing. Um, and I'm going to uh, hand things over to Mike in a second, but first um, I want to let you all know that I'm streaming in tonight from the unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Waswas Nation, which is also where the museum uh, calls home. Today, these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsun Tribal Band, whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. The Amamutsun are working hard to fulfill their obligation to create or to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts in the Amamutsun Land Trust, which we'll be learning more about tonight. Um, and I'd love to hear where you all are joining us from, um, specifically, uh, whose homeland you're streaming in from. So you can continue using the chat. Let us know if you know um, the tribe whose homeland you're streaming in from, you can uh, drop that in the chat. And if you are not yet sure, that is totally okay. Um, this is a great resource that you can use to figure that information out. So feel free to peruse that now. Um, and if you learn something interesting and wanna drop it in the chat at any point, please do. And again, uh, it makes things more interesting for all of us if when you send your uh, messages in the chat, you choose the option for everyone rather than the default, which is host and panelists. Um, let's see, we've got uh, some uh, answers coming in. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Donna. Um, so yeah, keep those coming. And uh, while you're looking into that, I would like to just introduce tonight's speaker, Mike Grohn, who is the Associate State Archaeologist for the Santa Cruz District of California Parks and Recreation. And uh, he just told me earlier that we have 32 parks within our district, which is wild. That's got to be a record, I would think, um, for the state. And prior to working for parks, he worked for the Amundsen Land Trust as a manager of their Coastal Stewardship Program and Archaeological Resource Management Program. And so I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen now and formally welcome in Mike. Hello, Mike. Hey, thanks for the introduction, Marisa. And thanks everyone for joining. I'm looking forward to chatting here with you tonight about some, some fun work that I feel fortunate to have been able to participate in over the past oh, seven or eight years now. Um, cool. Talk about a range of different things. I'm, I'm currently working as a the Associate State Archaeologist for the Santa Cruz District, but I'm going to focus this talk a little bit more on my work during my dissertation when I was at UC Berkeley working with the Amundsen Land Trust. Cool, and I'll just also um, chime in really quick just to let people know that if you have any um, questions or comments throughout Mike's presentation, you can drop them in the chat. Um, and I'll just save them up at the end and then I'll relay them to Mike at that time, but keep them coming. Uh, throughout, we'll get to them eventually. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So yeah, we're going to talk about a wide range of things. Uh, we're going to try to bring it from the ancient past to the present and see how that time scale can give us some options for managing future resources and making our coast more resilient in, in a number of different ways. Uh, this is, we're going to focus mostly on collaborative archaeology for the first half of the talk, which is a project that's been going on part of a collaborative research team between UC Berkeley, State Parks, UC Santa Cruz, and the Allen Woodson Land Trust since about 2007. Uh, I'm going to cover the, maybe the 2015s and on period. Uh, and then we're going to kind of talk about the, the more modern applied components of that project, you know, using this information about Native people's relationship to the coast over thousands of years to develop more sustainable and resilient sea-based you know, biodiversity-focused management protocols and, uh, and just increase access to the coast for the Elmwoods and Tribal Band, who we're gonna talk about a little bit more on this next slide. So this handsome. And I'll just share, um, Mike, we're seeing your like, behind the scenes end slide right now. Right. 
Okay, so maybe I go presenter view. Yeah, or it might be that you're sharing the, because you've got two PowerPoints. I wonder if you're, we're looking at the one that's um, got the various sites. Oh, gotcha. Let me switch out real quick. Okay, yeah, that's probably what's going on. Sharing, and then I'll bring it right back up. Always a technical difficulty. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How's that? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Alrighty, well, this fine gentleman here is Chairman Valentin Lopez. He's the elected chair of the Onwoods and Tribal Band and the chair of the board of the Onwoods and Land Trust, which is a subsidiary organization of the tribe that was formed in around 2013, I believe, um, that is geared towards restoring access to traditional lands, restoring knowledge that was suppressed during the Spanish mission period when native peoples in the area were forcibly removed in some cases from their traditional homelands and forced into the mission system. Not to say that native people weren't persisting and resisting through that brutal period of colonization, but we'll talk more in, in this next hour about how the, the push from the coast into the interior led a lot of traditional knowledge of coastal resources to be suppressed um, I met Jeremy Lopez in, I believe it was 2014, and he introduced to me this concept of dormant knowledge. Not that knowledge is lost necessarily, but that it is lying dormant within tribal members and also within archaeological resources and the data that we can extract from them. Archaeology has this long history in, in California and throughout the world that is not necessarily a, a positive history. And archaeologists have built their careers and their research interests on the backs of, of Native people and Indigenous people the world over and not included them in their research projects. Fortunately, I came into this relationship with Val and the tribe um, after a relationship had already been established through the lab that I was working in at UC Berkeley that was helmed by Kent Lightfoot and Rob Cuthrell. They'd been working with the Onwoods and Land Trust and Tribal Band since about 2007, looking at ancient fire management practices on the Santa Cruz and San Mateo coasts and uh, using archaeology and paleoethnobotany, paleoecology uh, as a means of kind of reconstructing fire intervals and looking at how Native people were managing the landscape with prescribed burns and cultural burns that prevented these big buildups of wildfires and and build up a fuel that led to destructive wildfires. In the back of this photo here, you see two of the uh, the Onwoods and Native Stewardship Corps members on screens. They were actually working at a site upland, just a little bit up from Davenport. Uh, it was a village site that had a lot of coastal materials a couple miles up from the coast. And so this relationship, this collaborative archeological relationship where Research interests are driven by tribal questions, whereas in a lot of cases in the past, research interests have been driven by archaeologists, non-tribal, non-native archaeologists coming in, getting clearance to do work, and often disturbing sensitive cultural remains and materials and human remains and sacred sites. And so what we've strived to do in our work together is mitigate the impacts to archaeological sites and sacred places as much as possible. and we call this like collaboration at the trial's edge where we're, we're in the units together, we're digging together, we're developing research questions together, we're going back to the lab and analyzing materials together, and we're coming up with our interpretations and writing our, our findings and publishing our work together. Uh, this is, I believe this program is kind of a, a great model that can be used throughout the state, throughout the world for how to engage on both sides, you know, tribes with archaeologists, archaeologists with tribes to have more holistic approaches in doing research. And so when I met Val, Chairman Lopez, they, there had been all this great work done on terrestrial resources and the use of different plants and the use of fire to manage them and make coastal prairies more productive and resilient. However, there hadn't been as much work done on marine resources. I had some background in in coastal archaeology, and there was another member of the lab at the time, Gabriel Sanchez, 
who had a background in fisheries, biology, and ichthyofaunal analysis. And so we started another project on a coastal site. I'm gonna skip back to this in just a second, up here at Sandhill Bluff. And this is just a little bit south of the town of Davenport, which is one of the oldest sites in the area, dating back to about 7,000 years to 3,000 years before present. And in this site are the remains of millions of shellfish and fish and some sea mammals and seabirds. And it speaks to the, the longstanding connections to the coast. And this was a kind of a prime testing ground for finding eco-archeological data, not human burials, not sensitive cultural remains, but data that the tribe is interested in and thinking about how their ancestors were engaging with coastal resources and how perhaps we might learn from that and apply that to some present day issues. And, and thinking about Amalutsen's relationship to their traditional homelands, you can see on this map, it's bordered by the dotted line. Um, a lot of their territory stretches you know, all the way down to Pinnacles National Park and is largely inland. A lot of tribal members today live far afield out in Fresno, Madera County, um, all the way up to Lake County. And so the, their presence on the coast has been reduced by all these waves of colonization, by the brutalities of the Spanish period, the Mexican period, and the American period, and also the high prohibitive cost of living along the coast in this area from San Mateo down to around Elkhorn Slough or, or Castroville area. But this project and the projects that I'll continue talking about really aim to restore that access and relationship to the coast through archaeology, through marine ecology, through fun beach days, uh, through a wide variety of projects. I already mentioned the emphasis on fire and the use of traditional methods of prescribed burning to increase the resilience and productivity of grasslands. What we were looking for in doing archaeology on this coastal site and a couple other neighboring coastal sites was analogous practices of management in marine resources. So can we see through time depth management of shellfish resources, of fisheries, of kelp and sea grasses, of marine mammals? I'll probably spare all the heavy data laden uh, information about that, you know, so we don't bore ourselves to tears here, but I will kind of touch upon some of the things we found. So this is, as I was mentioning, uh, an example of us working together in the field. It's me standing outside the unit with my hands in my pockets doing nothing. And my colleague, uh, Gabe Sanchez, down in the unit with four of the Native Stewardship Corps members uh, excavating a site just a little bit north of Santa Cruz that is in a heavily plowed field that's been disc plowed for Brussels sprout production and finally was taken out of production after seeing the amount of archaeological materials that were coming out of it and the sensitivity of the site. And so we went out, we did, before digging this unit, you know, we have this convenient, this photo looks as if we move a lot of soil, but in fact, we try to be really minimally invasive and rarely dig full units at all. Uh, oftentimes, we'll find eroding faces of sites and take column samples from them, we'll do auger units, before doing any excavation, we'll do ground penetrating radar and electrical resistivity and magnetometry to detect subsurface anomalies to try to hone in on things like hearths and features that don't look like burials, but look like they may have good ecological data buried within them. So there's a long process before we start digging that's done you know, directly in consultation and side by side with tribe members to ensure that you we're not digging up the wrong thing, that we want to be surgically precise. We want to get the sort of data we're looking for, and we want to avoid disturbing any sensitive materials. So we had run a few rounds of geophysics on, on this area, and we targeted it on a unit. We dug all the way down to a meter, and we found a well-intact deposit of shellfish and fish and ash and charcoal. Carefully sampled that. This is another site, uh, just a a little ways inland from Davenport on private property. And there's three Amamutsu native stewards working there with the UC Berkeley undergrad. 
screening soils. So in the field, we'll screen a lot of materials with fine grain screens so that we're not losing smaller materials. And a lot of archeological work in the past, and I'll talk about this more in a moment. In order to go through the amount of soil that people were digging and digging multiple units and covering a lot of aerial excavation surface, uh, they'd expedite the process of screening and often screen with quarter inch screens that, and you lose a lot of data that way. You lose small schooling fish, you lose plant remains. And so we would take samples, bulk sediment samples from each, uh, each arbitrary 10 centimeter layer that we excavate and curate those and take them back to the lab for further analysis down to a very fine grain scale. Um, in fact, I'd say for every hour in the field, we're spending at least, uh, at least a week sorting and analyzing things with a huge team of undergrads and grad students working a few things on the microscope and taking things down to a level of resolution to say about a millimeter. And for some things like paleoethnobotany, using electron scanning microscopes to get photos of seeds and pollen grains and, and really get a more fine grain nuanced understanding of past vegetation types. And so kind of doing a combination of environmental reconstruction zooarchaeological analysis, paleoethnobotanical analysis to give us these really resolved photos because if you don't dig that much, you know, you best extract the most information you can to address the questions that we've, you know, come together uh, to try to address. And the other thing is once you excavate a site, once you dig through a unit, you are in effect destroying the context of that, that particular area. You can't re-dig a site. And so we try to be as cautious and systematic in the process of doing that. And one thing we found in these sites in great abundance was California mussel, which is perhaps the most abundant constituent uh, in archaeological sites up and down the coast of California. They're a readily available resource. They reproduce relatively quickly. They're kind of like a plant, even though they're a mollusk. They, and that they stay rooted in the same place. So they can be managed similar to how plants are managed in some ways. They can be selected for different size classes. They could be rapidly depleted because they're easy to access when the tide's just a little bit low, but they can also be managed sustainably. And that's a conversation that happens in archeology span a lot. There's this notion of, of humans being inherently predisposed to deplete their resources, to target the high grade, uh, least, energy expended for the most uh, caloric value. Now, I don't know if, if we're all that rational in our food making decisions, I certainly know I'm not. Um, but our approach to, to looking at this sort of uh, analysis and our theoretical framework is guided by historical ecology, which looks at human-based relationships with the landscape through time and not with an inherent bias that people are going to deplete things or manage them sustainably. So we just see how the data plays out looking at these, these resource changes through time. When you have 3,000, 4,000 years of, of data of California mussels and their size through time, you can create a profile of harvesting over time. So we did that thousands of hours, it seemed, measuring, reconstructing the size of mussels from each level that corresponded to radiocarbon dates to give us a, a long-term perspective of change. And over the past, looked like 1500 to eight or 700 years ago, there was a trend of sustainable harvest and even the slight increase of California mussels looking at a medium sized class, not the smallest mussels, which haven't necessarily re reached uh, reproductive viability, and not the largest mussels, the large brooding stock who produce the most gametes and are responsible for kind of replenishing and restoring the population. We saw a, a pretty tight cluster in the data of these small to medium sized mussels being harvested continuously for thousands of years. That can make us think about a number of different things in terms of fishery management today. You know, um, oftentimes, we high grade and target large resources. Sometimes people are very rapidly harvesting things before they're at a viable stage to reproduce and replenish the population. And so this was an interesting finding that we've taken to 
apply in, in current omelets and projects for kind of guiding harvesting protocols through time. My slides are a little jumbled. This is the glorious lab where we're sorting everything to these fine scales, a lot of time on the scope. Um, but doing that kind of work and, and doing further analysis, chemical residue analysis, morphometric analysis, looking at size profiles through time, doing isotopic work to look at the, the temperature of the seawater, or model the temperature of the seawater when an organism was harvested. California mussels maintain and absorb seawater as they're growing and seawater carbon isotopes vary throughout the year based on the salinity and temperature of the water. So you can get the size class harvested and the season of harvest, which we were finding mostly falling in kind of the late fall to early spring area. So avoiding that, that summer period that we still have in effect in quarantine on mussels um, you know, driven by harmful algal blooms. A couple other funky things that we found when looking at things at a really small size scale were uh, seaweed limpets and these, and a number of other gastropods, small snails that are not commonly associated with uh, dietary foods and because they're so small. However, they're a proxy for evidence of harvesting seaweeds and seagrasses. A few of them like this lovely little critter here, Ladia incessa, lives exclusively on the stipes of feather boa kelp, which is a, you know, can occupy the subtitle all the way up to the mid upper tidal zones and is readily available for harvest. It's edible. Seaweeds can be used for a number of things besides just food, for steaming other foods, for transporting materials. There's medicinal properties in seaweeds and evidence of productive healthy kelp forests in the past. Uh, suggest that people weren't outstripping marine resources like abalone and sea otters that help regulate and maintain health, healthy kelp forests. We have a crisis today and we're having a lot of loss and die off of our kelp forests from the overpopulation of urchins based on the historic extirpation of sea otters and also increasing storm surges, climate change, ocean acidification, salinity changes, all these different factors. But we see these seaweed limpets and another, a number of other small gastropods. These are uh, Litterina and Lacuna genus uh, snails, little periwinkles living on the blades of, of seagrasses and eelgrasses, which can be used for cordage and a number of other utilitarian purposes by native people. So finding these things in the record helps restore this kind of knowledge of, of how ancestral and lots of people were relating to marine resources harvesting mussel beds, digging for clams, harvesting seaweed and uh, seagrasses. And we've kind of looked at what other tribes up and down the coast, especially in the North Coast where colonization wasn't as intense and look at their contemporary management practices for some of these resources. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about our partnerships with neighboring tribes um, to kind of weave in this, this data a little bit. I just had to include I include this one, little one, Ladia pelta, because it's just so cute with little antlers. And it's cruising around on some, uh, some black larch, which is an edible uh, brown algae that, or maybe it's a red algae that is in the higher intertidal zone. So we talk about the applied significance of this work, right? You know, we're not just doing archaeology for data sake, we're doing it to restore knowledge and to restore relationship to the coast. Like I said, a lot of Amaluts and tribal members and youth live hours and hours away from the coast. And so we put together youth summer camps, wherein for a couple weeks at a time, groups of youth members and young adults and interns and the Native Stewardship Corps, which is comprised of mostly young adults, we come out, we go tide pooling. We'd walk around and, you know, kind of just field all sorts of questions like this is what we're finding in the archaeological record. This is evidence being used for hundreds of years or thousands of years. These are ways you can sustainably harvest this resource. These are the best times of the year to do it. In the archaeological record, we see this being managed a certain way. Perhaps we could apply that to modern harvesting practices to make them a little more resilient and sustainable, even on a small scale. These were especially fun days, you know, poking around a different type of seaweed, trying them out 
harvesting shellfish, going fishing. And it, it, this is like the most, you know, academics like to publish their papers and analyze their data. And I think increasingly are starting to see the, the multi-scale holistic benefits of community engagement. And these sort of days were more fun to me than any day in the field excavating or doing analysis though that provided a foundation of building relationships through time. Um, but we'd just be running around like wild through the intertidal zone, making sure that the, we weren't getting stuck in search channels and go body surfing afterwards for the day. And maybe we're focusing on the tensile strength of bull kelp types and how they resist strong storm surges and how they grow at a certain rate. But we're also twisting them around and doing some double dutch and just having a grand old time. But these are, you know, some of my fondest memories. And this is around the time that I was wrapping up my dissertation work in 2019 or so. And fortuitously, at that time, Ombudsman was Philanthropist was wanting to start a coastal stewardship program. And I thought, great, you know, I, I'll forego the academic route and the cultural resource management route, and I will hop on as a consultant and contractor and work for the land trust. So I'm going to pop over to a, a different set of slides to talk about that work a little bit more to see how we you know, really apply all this in the long range for the modern ecological crises that we're facing. I'm going to escape here and then share a different screen real quick. Bear with me. All righty, got about lined up. Wish I could see y'all. I feel like I'm just kind of preaching to my living room right now. Okay. We good there? Yep, looks good. All righty, thank you so much. So we take this data from the past and we try to apply it to the present with the goal of making a more resilient future. And those are kind of the pillars, mission statement, as it were, of the Coastal Stewardship Program. A few of the other goals are restoring access to the coast. As we mentioned, you know, a lot of tribal members have to travel significant distances. So we're applying for grants to facilitate that travel. And at this point, actually, Amundsen has secured housing in Bonnie Dune area. They've got a nice house up there uh, to house tribal members coming to and from the area. My current role in state parks, we're trying to work on developing uh, tribal campgrounds that can be used and more readily accessed. So that's a big component of this, restoring access to Amundsen tribal land territory. We also want to restore health and resilience to the ocean and coast and do that by combining traditional ecological knowledge and resource management practices with modern marine ecology and sort of citizen science efforts and data analysis and databasing of all the resources that we're encountering in a given area through time. And I'll talk about the areas that we uh, visit and survey. Um, and in doing that, restore a sense of connection and restore that dormant knowledge to tribal members who are developing their relationship with the coast. We begin that with monitoring at different areas, rocky intertidal zones, sandy shores, estuaries, freshwater, saltwater interfaces like river mouths, kelp forests, seagrass beds, etc. We'll return to these areas consistently over the years in order to develop uh, a kind of growing database of management needs, of things that we're seeing in abundance there, of things that are perhaps deleterious to the environment, you know, erosion, trash buildup, trails, um, and use that to develop stewardship protocols that are based on what we're observing in the present, but also are in line with traditional ecological knowledge and ancestral relationships to the landscape. And then finally, how we can apply that to sustainable harvesting protocols in the present that will make resources productive in the long term. We can't just directly apply the archaeological data because things have changed significantly. There's a lot more people here. 
there are a lot more pressing issues on the coast. There's a lot more erosion. There are introduced invasive species. There are a whole host of issues that we face today that I, you know, we all may know a fair amount about that I could go on at length. But I should, I should underlie this statement by saying that, or, or all these goals by saying that the coastal stewardship program is, is under a broad umbrella of the Tribal Marine Stewards Network, which is a, an alliance of tribes from on the Woodson Territory all the way up to the northern coast of California, working together to, to address these same sort of goals and management practices in their traditional territories. That project has been funded for a couple of years now and more funding has come through and it looks like it is out of pilot stage and into permanence. And I'm no longer the manager of this program. It's currently June Tretza who works for the Young Woods and Land Trust. And so I can point you towards her after this if you have any follow-up questions about the, the current state of the program. Um, when I was on board, our, our current projects started with coastal resource monitoring, just looking at all those different habitat types and the resources within them and taking an inventory of all the different species we're seeing, all of the potential risks to the environment, the changes from low tide to high tide, um, to kind of build an ongoing database throughout the seasons to see about fluctuation and change. We'd also prioritize areas with coastal archeological sites that are endangered from a, a number of different uh, aspects like erosion, looting. People like to go to archeological sites and collect things. Um, as an archeologist, I feel like most of the people that I meet when I tell them that I'm an archeologist want to tell me about their private collection of things that they've been uh, illegally looting from sites for decades. So don't do that. And if you do know the location of archeological sites, try to keep them discreet. Um, because they are disappearing resources. And once they're disturbed, they don't retain their data integrity. And clearly they are important to not just native people, but all people you know, in understanding our collective history and examples of how humans relate to environments through time. There are examples of us overdoing it and being unsustainable. And there are also examples of us acting as stewards. And that that data is embedded in archeological resources. And I think that, that that is something sacred and, and scientifically valuable you know, on both sides of the spectrum. And so we would do site surveys, oftentimes doing resource monitoring and mapping of uh, important cultural resources adjacent to archeological sites. A couple other fun projects that are happening. Uh, one was the removal of the Mill Creek Dam just a little bit north of Santa Cruz. And we were working with the team at UCLA doing environmental DNA sampling for salmonids in that watershed, looking at the presence and absence of coho and steelhead. Actually, the dam came down last October and recently Semper Virens Fund announced that they have spotted 15 coho salmon in the creek for the first time. So we have a, a great success from that project. There's also a, a, an ongoing project that myself, and a couple other archeologists, Gabe Sanchez and Alec Apodaca and Amuluts and Land Trust are working on trying to reconstruct the ancient biogeography of salmon from the San Francisco Bay down to Monterey. And to, in, in so doing, to guide, well, I spelled salmon it's wrong that second time, um, in order to guide modern fisheries policy. A lot of these different creeks and streams have protections for coho or steelhead or both or one or the other. And uh, we're trying to look at sites and collections that have salmon bones in them and then do uh, ancient DNA analysis and proteomics to understand the species specific salmon that are living in different streams and see how that can guide policy uh, around fisheries management going into the future. We look at a number of different sites and I'll kind of go through the Rolodex here for a moment. Um, to the north extent of Alma Woodson Territory is Anya Nuevo State Park, which is a beautiful area for those of you who have been and those of you who haven't, you should try to get yourself out there. 
coming up on elephant seal breeding season. We need a, uh, a guided tour to get out there to see them in action, but uh, it's well worth the visit. And, you know, once a good place, always a good place. There has been uh, dozens of archeological sites recorded within Ani Nuevo State Park and along the coast in the, the coastal dune field there. And we've done work on a lot of those sites. We've excavated and analyzed a significant number of the sites. We're continuously mapping them as they're constantly getting damaged and eroded by sea level change, by increased wave action, wind, people walking over them, but also these elephant seals. They're like well, many excavators or not so many excavators. An elephant seal goes cruising through a site and can deflate a significant portion of it. So we try to go back to this area routinely to monitor the sites and, and you know, just take stock of how things are changing through time. There's also some abundant kelp forests off the coast of Banya Nuevo. We've been working to develop a drone mapping project of that to look at the seasonal fluctuation of kelp forest health and canopy cover. Uh, of course, there are the marine mammals, which which aren't the the elephant seals aren't present in the archaeological record. They uh, they arrived I think some sometime around the 70s and they're charismatic in their own way and they got protection uh, in this area of the coast and they've got a pretty well established rookery out there. And while they may be the bane of archaeological sites, they're they're pretty they're good for tourism and but tourism also brings in increased foot traffic and and pressure to that area and the sites there. So we'll go to Anya Nuevo regularly to do monitoring work. We'll also pop down the coast to Laguna Creek, and look at the beach there and look at the lagoon. There's an abundance of resources and this is adjacent to another archeological site where we see evidence of organisms from all manner of different uh, habitat types, from lagoons, from freshwater fishes, saltwater fishes, seabirds, wide range of different shellfish that are present in the sandy shore like burrowing clams and also rocky intertidal associates like abalone and mussels. Also monitor the site while we're there. Um, some of this is done just walking around filling out a long list. Uh, we also are trying to incorporate drone survey mapping to get consistent images of the extent of the lagoon throughout the year, whether or not it's connecting to the, the coast. Other areas down here at Davenport Beach, which is the creek, uh, the creek mouth of San Vicente, a little further up, Mill Creek, where the, that dam was removed, uh, filters into San Vicente Creek. So we've been doing work all along the San Vicente watershed, um, even up to the uplands, up towards Bonnie Dune, looking at Sandy Shore associates, looking at the rocky intertidal zone on the north and south end of the beaches, and also doing that environmental DNA sampling right at the river mouth and then further up towards the dam site at a number of different sites to see the movement of, of salmonids and different fishes. I didn't really talk too much about the eDNA, but it's a pretty neat technique if you haven't uh, heard of it before or looked into it too much. So just as we shed our hair and skin, uh, so do all other organisms one way or another and fish shed scales and, and shed their DNA in the water that they're swimming around in. You can just take a bag of uh, a bag of seawater, a bag of fresh water, and filter it through a micron's thin screen. And if you have the primers, the genetic primers for the organism you're looking for, say you're looking for coho or steelhead, and you have uh, the genes already lined up in your database, you can compare and contrast and get full biodiversity of all the organisms living in the water. It's pretty neat stuff. It's a little bit above my pay grade analytically, but. Uh, that's been an ongoing project there and it's, it's bearing fruit and we're seeing successes with the return of coho. I talked a little bit about this just now, the eDNA sampling. I've also done some integrative cultural resource survey. That's a, pro a program that was developed by Rob Cuthrell uh, when he was working for Elmwood's Land Trust. And this is an approach to, to doing surveys where we're looking not just for archeological resources, but we're looking at the entire landscape as a cultural landscape. So looking for ethnobotanically important species or viewsheds, rock shelters, caves, freshwater 
streams, perennial sources of fresh water, and kind of overlaying that into an, a cultural landscape that's looking at ancient present on the ancient presence of native people on the land, but also the contemporary ecological and abiotic diversity as well. And that's become a, a pretty cool approach for thinking holistically about landscapes. There's some heavily human modified areas that we go to as well, like Moss Landing, where you have the you know, development of a massive jetty and harbor, along with the sandy shores that are on both sides of the jetty and harbor. We'll do surveys there. We've done a little bit of kelp harvesting and fishing off the jetty. Um, this is the mouth to Elkhorn Slough, which is our, our next spot we're gonna talk about, which is a very interesting area. Uh, incredibly important for seabird migration and sea otter refuge. So this is just one of the other areas we check out. And up here to Elkhorn Slough, there are a number of archeological sites throughout the slough that are, some of them well-documented, some of them not so much. Um, there are eelgrass beds, abundant eelgrass beds, frankly, that you know, provide habitat for a variety of different fishes and also are the spawning grounds for for herring and some small schooling fishes that lay their eggs on the eelgrass and they adhere to the eelgrass until they mature and turn into little baby fishes. Also some other cultural resources like feathers that are important for ceremony and regalia that are, are present in some of the different uh, groves that have nesting bird sites. We'll go collect feathers that have dropped there. And finally, the uh, oyster restoration project that's a partnership between the Land Trust, some grad students at Moss Landing Marine Labs, and the Elkhorn Slough National Estuary and Research Reserve. Or they're attempting different ways to outplant and propagate native oysters, Austria lurida, the Olympic oyster, which is a sensitive oyster. Um, a lot of the oysters that we're accustomed to, you know, that we see in restaurant menus are introduced for the most part. All of them are introduced, uh, whether it's from Japan or the East Coast or you know further up towards Alaska. Most oysters that we're encountering in our cuisine are non-native and native oysters are especially sensitive and difficult and uh, to, to propagate and harvest successfully. They're really temperature selective, they're really saline sensitive and so fluctuations in temperature and salinity really affect them. This, there's a project going on right now, a continuing ongoing project that is just trying to track different ways to, to outplant oysters and, and get them to you know, an age where they can propagate themselves. And the Land Trust works closely with the, the S Elkhorn Slough staff down there. Future projects, some of these are already happening. Um, so there's scuba training for uh, a number of the onwards and Native Stewardship Corps. Some of the goals of that are to do, you know, scientific diving, but also removal of urchins in areas where urchin barrens have started to prohibit the growth of new kelp. Doing water quality monitoring and harmful algae bloom assessment. There's goals to expand the eDNA sampling program to different watersheds throughout the area and to get a sense of migration and movement and biogeography of different fish species and then continuing with with more kelp forest survey kind of integrating satellite imagery historic photos contemporary drone survey and hopefully working with other agencies and other research groups in the area because i feel like monterey bay the greater monterey bay area is a hotbed for marine research and Right now, Amamutz and Land Trust is really trying to expand their programs, but organize in a way that they're sustainable over the long term, that they have the capacity to carry out these projects. And yeah, I just feel fortunate to have been involved in the capacity that I have been over the years. I've learned a tremendous amount, not just about archaeology or marine ecology, but just being a being a human. I feel like I've learned so much in the time that I spent as a consultant and contractor with the Land Trust. I was living out of the back of my truck for basically the entirety of the pandemic, a couple of weeks on the, in the field, living with the stewards, doing archeology, span doing 
marine resource monitoring, going bowling at the end of the day, having campfires, like really embedding within the community. And that's one, that's, I think what I'll end on is uh, there's a lot of talk these days about ethical partnerships with tribal organizations and working with and for tribes as, an, as non-native people and how to best be an ally. And I feel like it takes a, a long span of commitment and genuine interest and care and compassion and, and understanding the, the struggles that a lot of native people face, whether it's historic trauma or displacement from their traditional territories or all the barriers to access and relearning and re-engaging and just the, sort of the systemic oppression that still exists today as a you know, continued effect of colonialism. You know, colonial, colonialism didn't stop at any point. Like we're still living in this sort of late stage capitalism here in California. And so I would recommend anyone to, to take a look at a couple of resources. We'll go on the Amundsen or website and look at their current projects, see about ways you can volunteer and help. They have a, a native plant propagation program right now that they're looking for volunteers for. There is a campaign right now to protect a sacred site, Eurostock. It's protecteurostock.org, wherein one of their most sacred sites is being slated for development for a, a gravel mine and there are just a number of different ways that we can practice allyship and community engagement from a from a non like savior perspective, and I think that's something you know to be to be wary of. And if we're going to be giving land acknowledgments, to also have you know your own personal call to action, and and try to really follow through on things rather than just taking an interest and and having your own personal gain from that or your sense of satisfaction and uh and service i think it, it really takes a, a lifetime of commitment in some ways and that's that's the trajectory i'm on is continuing to work with the land trust as the state parks archaeologist um, and kind of cultural re resource program guide how to continue working agency to agency government to government and build capacity expand projects and have some fun in the process of doing it and learn from each other and, and try to build that more holistic, resilient future that we're talking about. So I think I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Thanks for, for being here with me and taking the time. And if anybody has questions or follow-up, I'd be happy to, to chat. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, this is very informative, insightful presentation. And I appreciate your, uh, Closing, closing thoughts there, as do many in uh, the chat. Um, and we do have a couple of questions that have popped up. Let me see if I can gather them all. Um, so one question that came in from Mary was um, about all of the many sites that you uh, covered, which it's amazing to learn about um, all of the work that is uh, happening across the Central Coast. There are so many different projects and so many different sites. Um, you didn't mention the San Lorenzo River, and Mary's curious if there's if there have been any projects there. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the last time I spoke with the, the Coastal Stewardship Program Manager, June, she'd said that they were starting to do surveys down on Cowell Beach, and and they wanted to expand the environmental DNA sampling throughout the San Lorenzo River. I'm not sure if they've gotten started on that. That's part of like that collaboration with UC LA. Mm. And, but I know that's one of the areas targeted to, to be surveyed and to do more water quality sampling and environmental DNA work. But at present, I'm not, I don't think that work has begun. Okay. Um, another thought that I had about um, coastal archaeology is the fact that we've actually experienced um, some sea level rise since humans have inhabited the coast here. And so presumably um, there are archaeological sites that are off the coast as well. And you mentioned that um, some of the land stewards are um, getting their scuba certification and the amazing uh, 
hopeful projects that will come from that. But I'm just curious, like, is there any hope to actually do um, other types of archaeological research underwater? Yeah, that's a great question. So underwater, underwater archaeology is cool just inherently, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And that's a great point you bring up that, that I failed to mention when talking about, you know, sites that are 7,000 years old. At 7,000, 8,000 years ago, the sea level was significantly further out. Yeah. So stabilized around 5,000 years ago or so, and it's been gradually increasing um, after the last you know, post-glacial period in the Pleistocene. And so a lot of the sites that we're looking at that we consider our, our oldest coastal sites or just coastal sites in general were perhaps a mile inland in, in massive dune fields. And so a lot of those sites have been lost and just through erosion and getting pulled out to sea. There's been some interest in looking at uh, sea caves off the coast. It's kind of tricky because we live in an area where there's such high wave energy mm. that the seafloor is constantly shifting around. There are some areas like in the Santa Barbara Channel Islands on the, you know, not the wave action heavy sides, like on the east sides of the islands where there are caves that have some intact deposits where people have been doing underwater archaeology. But the northern coast and the Monterey Bay, the northern Monterey Bay are so prone to just high wave stress that at present we don't have a very resolved understanding of any of the underwater archaeology. There's some shipwreck archaeology up near Pigeon Point and, and other areas that uh, it's been, we've, we've discussed doing this sort of work and it's been a little bit confounding because of undertow and wave stress and, and just the constantly shifting floors. But there was a paper recently about detecting ancient paleosols, like from, from ancient estuarine environments, like say when Elkhorn Slough may have been further out to the coast when Monterey Bay coastline was another mile back or so, that we could look in some of those areas around that big trench that might have evidence of some archeological type soils, but we haven't quite got there yet, but it's, it is an exciting avenue. Yeah, I guess, so you you mentioned a mile off coast, like that's, that is very far. Um, again, I was assuming, so I know of um, some of our like local sites uh, that like higher ground mm -hmm. is desirable, like you don't wanna be in a flood plain um, and, so with those sites that are under water currently, I would assume, I guess in my mind, I think of them as sort of flat, like still sort of floodplain situations, but is it possible that there are actual village sites that would have been higher ground? Yeah, that, that are no longer higher ground. Yeah. There, I'm, there are, there's a story that is, was passed down through I'm trying to remember the name of the ethnographic informant who told this story about, about tsunamis, about a monster from the ocean coming and wiping a village out, about waves coming up especially high and dragging an entire village out to sea. And that was kind of like used as a parable or a, a parable for, for tsunamis and rogue waves and king tides and how that can yeah. wrap, pull away an entire village. And so it's, in the same vein, you know, once a site reaches the coast around here, it starts to get pulled apart pretty rapidly from waves. So mm -hmm. the likelihood of an in intact site that's deeply buried, I mean, I don't want to be a pessimist, but it seems yeah. a little bit low, but there is there is some protected areas potentially that we could have that sort of information, but we haven't yeah. quite yet. Okay. Um, we also had a technical question from Kari. Um, about terminology, what is a unit? Unit. Um, you mentioned excavating units. What does yeah. that mean? So we just call it's like a metric, you know, a one by one meter unit will be a start as a square and then we'll three dimensionally or aerially work down and excavate either in 10 centimeter arbitrary levels and just chalk our way deeper. Or if we hit what we call natural stratigraphy, where there are, there's evidence of an intact archaeological deposit, we'll start carefully excavating around that within that squared unit. 
units can be 50 centimeters by 50, they can be five meters by five. Um, but when you look at, you know, uh, an archaeological site or some of the images that you might see in the old world, for example, like people excavating whole cities, they'll work down one unit at a time or they'll expand their units horizontally when they start encountering other things. So a unit is just a basic excavation uh, area. Okay. Um, Marion is curious of the 32 parks that are within your district, which is your favorite? Oh, well, that's a great question, Marion. <laughs> um, that's a tough one. There's so many cool parks, you know, there's, I love the, the southern part of town, like New Brighton and Seacliff and Sunset, and Pajaro Dunes, those are all really beautiful, just wide open beaches. For those of you who like long walks on the beach, <laughs> yeah. um, there's cool stretches there. There's actually at the north end of New Brighton, I was checking it out the other day, there's these fossil shell beds from the Purissima Foundation, they're like 5 million years old. You can see embedded old clams down in the in the base of the formation there at low tide. Anya Nuevo's got to be up there. I mean, it's it's just so beautiful. There's good surf, not too many people around. Kelp forest, seabirds, pelicans cruising by. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite. Henry Cowell School. That's where I, that's where my office is, and there's giant redwoods everywhere. Uh, I'm jaded. You know? Yeah, the, we got a lot of good ones around here. Everywhere you go is a good place. Um, speaking of Anya Nuevo, I went there once on a geology walk and we were walking down um, like basically through a fault line, I think, like the path followed the fault line down towards the beach. And we were uh, surrounded by, um, you know, the cliffs on both sides. And there were uh, like more recent deposits and there were little bits of like charcoal mm -hmm. in there. Um, is that something that you've also studied like evidence of of charcoal in um soil or in like more recent deposits that uh, give us an indication of burns of prescribed or cultural burns yeah fantastic question um yeah the the lab that i worked in at uc berkeley the california archaeology lab has a couple of just world-class paleoethnobotanists rob cockerel and alec apodaca and Rob and the tribe have done a number of projects looking at sediment cores from lake beds, from sag ponds to do environmental reconstruction. And you get pollen, charcoal, and pollen grains and starch grains. And you can use those sort of things to reconstruct environment. You know, if you're, there's areas where everything is dominated by Douglas fir, but the pollen record or the charcoal record looks like it was all grassland and, uh, Redwood. And so that's been some of the ongoing work looking at that ancient ethnobotanical plant use and what woods are being used for fuels. Like we see a lot of California lilac being used as a fuel wood or Ceanothus <laughs> grows back really fast. And it's not the biggest, hardiest wood, but it's readily manageable as a fuel source. And you see a lot of that turning up in charcoal deposits. Um, but yeah, that you can also get a sense of the frequency of fire intervals from charcoal deposits because they can be radiocarbon dated to a given time period. Overlay that with dendrochronology and looking at uh, tree rings and looking at the burn scars on them to, to get a sense of the frequency of, of burns and see how that corresponds to the charcoal record and see how that corresponds to the traditional resource management practice we know about. But then you can go a step further and model the frequency of lightning strikes on the coast it's like the CZU fire was a very rare event. Lightning doesn't hit this area very often. It's often more up in the Sierras. And uh, so you can look at the difference between uh, anthropogenic fire and a natural wildfire or a non-human lit wildfire and look at the changes in frequency and intensity. But yeah, we try to use like as many different disciplines and approaches and lines of evidence to understanding these change, changes through time. And But those... Those charcoal records are indispensable. And for you and the paleobotanists, like, are you sharing um, units, <laughs> or oh, yeah. is it sort of like does it need to be handled differently if it's something that like what you're looking for versus what Rob is looking for? 
No, we kind of have a, a uniform systematic way of excavating. Um, though if we're going to do like physical geography stuff and do pollen samples, that's its, that's its own discrete okay. approach. Um, like if we're doing cores versus just regular excavating. Um, we'll take samples, we'll take bulk sediment samples, and those will get floated. So some material is screened, but in order to get to really small fine grain stuff, we'll take 10 liters of soil from a given level or five liters of soil, depending on how dense the assemblage or the archeological material is, and we'll float it and agitate it in water and the light materials will float to the top, we'll screen those with the micron screen, and then collect all the heavy materials, the shell, the bone. And uh, you know, the, the high level guys are looking at the, the fine grain stuff at the paleoethnobotany. I'm just a, I'm a coarse fellow looking at bones and shells and, and stuff that you can mostly see with the naked eye. Um, but so that approach of taking those bulk samples and then sometimes taking an additional bulk sample and curating that for when the discipline evolves and we have even mm -hmm. more refined approaches to understanding things. That, that's a critical thing. You know, when you excavate a site, you're destroying it in effect, but you can curate material for, for when the future comes and inherently we know more and have better approaches for doing things. Yeah, that's great. That's cool. Um, and are you still looking at bones and shells or is that not really a part of your job anymore? Oh yeah, when I can squeeze it, <laughs> I can get the time to. I, uh, I've got a project going on right now, looking at a bunch of shellfish from a bunch of collections that are curated in the Henry Cowell facility. Um, that's mm. kind of my, little, my happy place, you know, I can put everything in its place and know what it is and think about how it lived and um, I don't do as much research and analysis, like straight up analysis as I used to. That in the parks role, I'm kind of giving presentations and touring sites and working on compliance and legal protocols. But I'm also trying to expand work with the tribe and mm -hmm. archaeologists and kind of facilitate other research projects. You know, I'm trying, still trying to keep my feet wet in the research game as much as I can. Um, I got a pretty good shell collection in my house that keeps me occupied just rearranging it cool um speaking of shells so the i think it was so the mollusk the little one it looked like a limpet to me but i don't know if it was a limpet um that uh you find on uh seagrass mm -hmm. so you were saying that the, the fact that you found those shells indicates that they were harvesting seagrass do you have a sense of what this, like why they were harvesting seagrass? So that's, that's another great question. The, uh, what we've used in some cases is analogies for what other tribes up and down the coast are doing that have, you know, a continuous relationship with the coast, especially in the Northern area. And seagrasses were used for, uh, for cordage materials. They're really tensile strong and it can be woven into baskets. They can also be used to just expediently wrap things up and transport them inland. You see a lot of shellfish in sites miles inland. And oftentimes the cordage is right available there in seagrass. Mm -hmm. Fish lay their eggs on them and the seagrass can be harvested with the eggs on them and dried just like that. And then the eggs can you know, be stored or eaten after they're dried. So there's kind of, a, there's some food waste purposes and there's some utilitarian purposes for them. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and then we've got another question about Anya Nuevo. I don't know if this is your expertise, but Haley wants to know. Um, she believes you said that uh, elephant seals only started showing up around the 70s. And uh, if that's true, do you know why? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, the why, like a philosophical existential kind <laughs> or like a how? Well, seals had been intensively hunted off of San Francisco and off of the coast for a number of years. And so a lot of rookeries sort of moved away from coastal environments. And prior to uh, Europeans showing up and extirpating grizzly bears, there was an abundance of grizzly bears in the area. And so it didn't make it the best uh, relaxing habitat for seals to just be kind of laying in wait for grizzly bears to descend upon them. Some of the early Spanish accounts talk about herds of grizzly bears uh, descending upon whale carcasses that washed up and 
like in Rancho del Oso up at Waddell Creek, there were hundreds of bears that were observed, recorded, shot, taken back to adobes for bull and bear fights. And so the presence of bears on the landscape and really big bears that don't hibernate because California it doesn't require hibernation, they just keep eating year round, wouldn't have been you know, the most ideal habitat for seals to be hanging around. Um, and you don't see elephant seals in the archeological record. They dive really deep and they hang out deep offshore and have huge migratory ranges. I think that there was a founding pair that showed up. It was before 72, but I think in 72 is when they kind of designated parts of the Marine Mammal Protection Act um, to give them refuge at Año Nuevo. They showed up, started breeding, and more started showing up and working their way up from San Simeon and from further north. But I think the founding pair came up from like Guadalupe Island. I think that was their genetic lineage. I could be a hair off on that. Um, but now there's no bears, and they're protected, and they're lounging in the sun. And um, I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. So you mentioned that they, you don't really find evidence of them in the archeological record. So is it possible that they actually were here and then got overhunted and then now they're back or is that unlikely? Yeah, you know, we would think there are other pinnipeds, there are other sea mammals that we do see in the archeological record like the mm -hmm. North Perth seal that, that was present and perhaps required some offshore technology to harvest. We don't have good documentation of whether or not people were uh, seafaring off of the coast, pretty treacherous coast to be cruising around in a Thule boat, but um, there, are, there is evidence of harvesting of sea mammals, but there's, and there's a long record on the northern Santa Cruz coast of northern fur seal and sea otters in some areas, but there's, there's just that complete absence as of yet of, yeah. of elephant seals. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then uh, KD is uh, wondering if we can see any of the excavated findings anywhere. Are they in any museums on exhibit online? Yeah, great question. So right now, just about everything is curated um, from these projects that I've been talking about at the Henry Cowell Archaeological Resource Facility that I manage. Um, they're all boxed up. But if, if you wanted to take a look at at kind of the, the findings in context, there's a, a publication that I shared that was a recent publication, 2021, that a bunch of different co-authors from Berkeley, Parks, the tribe, um, all worked on together to kind of synthesize a lot of this information. I believe there's some artifactual photos in there, but a lot of the, the material is, is curated and, and kind of boxed away at present. Um, if you're especially keen to cruise by, you shoot me an email and come check out the archaeological resource facility sometime. Uh, collections management facility, I should say. The ARF is at Berkeley. Switch my P's and Q's sometimes. But look, I, I linked a, a PDF or I sent Marisa a PDF that can be shared that has a lot of the findings of this research. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share that in a follow-up email that will be sent out to everyone once the recording is processed. So. Um, we'll get this up uh, online so that folks who couldn't join us tonight can watch and I'll send an email out uh, with some resources, including a talk that we um, had with uh, Rob Cuthrell last year about his research too. So if you're interested in learning more about um, the paleobotany side, uh, you can watch that one. And then I'll also just note that I went through a um, program at the Santa Cruz uh, Mission State Historic Park that's called the Summer Archaeology Project. Um, and they're still going on and you can go through training to help sort materials from Santa Clara University. And there's just like a lot of really amazing enrichments that go along with that too. So if any of you are interested in learning more about archaeology in a way that like you're also like contributing um, to the understanding by helping to basically categorize um, the smallest of the, of the small. That's not too small that it's only for the, the big wigs, but um, small enough that it's tedious for folks like Mike. Um, you like say, this one's a shell, this one's a piece of adobe, this one's a bone, um, things like that. And so it's a great, I, I'll uh, send a link out about that too. 
Um, and then I, we're at 712. So I had another question, but I'm just going to call it um, and just say thank you, Mike. This is uh, really, really wonderful and uh, hope to be able to partner up with you um, more. You're in Santa Cruz. It's great. Um, and we probably will try to take you up on that tour. I'm sure you'll be getting lots of emails. Awesome. Um, well, I look forward to it. Thanks for having me. Thank everyone for attending and all your thoughtful questions. And uh, I'll see you around. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone. Good night.